Hey guys, this is Ben the Coin Geek at Old Pueblo Coin, and today I have an interview with John Albanese of Certified Acceptance Corporation, also known as CAC or CAC, the company that puts their little green sticker on certified holders to let you know that they approve of the coin quality. And uh, this interview is about uh, a few things, mostly about the fact that they've got a new new thing coming along here with grading coins themselves instead of just putting stickers on them. Uh, and as always, take some time, if you would, to go ahead and leave your comments down below. And uh, as always, hit the like button if you like the video. If you don't like the video, you're in good company. So sit back and enjoy. And without further ado, here's John. Hey everybody, it's Ben the Coin Geek here with John Albanese of uh, CAC Certified Acceptance Corporation. And uh, John, thanks so much for joining me today. Pleasure. Uh, so for those who don't know who John Albanese is, can you give us the 60 second biography? 60 seconds. Well, I mean, I've, I've been a coin, I've been a coin collector since I was young, since really 1964. So that was five years old, that's when I started. And um, you know, fortunately, uh, or unfortunately, a coin shop opened up when I was about 13 and I rode my bike there and uh, I ran to Bill Wetzler there, who's now one of my graders, who's an all-star grader. He worked there as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andy Block uh, gave me a job after a few months, saw how excited I was. Of course, in those days, we, you didn't get paid. You got paid like $2 an hour, but you got to take coins, right? Yes, you, you, I understand the feeling. Yeah, so uh, I, I I was a I I, um, I worked in a coin shop and uh, and that that's how it all started. I've been in but I've been in business full time since late 1978. Yeah, and so uh, you're known as someone who has uh, started several coin grading companies uh, involved with PCGS and NGC, mm -hmm. and then uh, to get into what's a what's been announced recently, I just got to hit something from about 15 years ago and talk a little bit about CAC originally. Mm -hmm. which is the uh, the little green bean that everyone talks about nowadays. At what point in the marketplace, at what time did you see the need for CAC, uh, the, the green bean, and what, what prompted you to create that? Well, I probably saw it in the... Um... I mean, I mean, first of all, it's it's always it's always been an issue in the coin business, and as you know, just like snowflakes, not all coins are alike, and and a lot of times the grade alone doesn't describe the value, uh, doesn't slot a coin for proper value, and if you stated in some of your podcasts, sometimes even a, a, a lower grade is worth more if it has better eye appeal, and we see that in today's market where a beautiful AU fifty eight or a fifty eight plus coin could be worth more than a an MS sixty two coin or sixty three even possibly. So, you know, I just found that the, I felt there was a need because there was, there was a large disparity in coins of uh, coin price of coins in the same grade. I always prided myself on buying coins on the upper end of the range, and I found it uh, I found it a bit frustrating, um, even selling coins to friends and neighbors, even at my cost, a bit frustrating. The fact that um, maybe I was charging six thousand for a coin and and that was at my cost, and they could buy it for four thousand, right? You know, with a deal on making a profit. So, I, I just it just seemed to me like a natural. There need to be a way to formalize um, the, the better coins. So, CAC was really again just recognizing the coins that were higher end for the grade. Did you think it was going to work? Uh, you know, I I was. I hate to say, I mean, I'm, I'm afraid to fail, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm very methodical and I think things out. And I thought about it for two years. Um, and I, I, I wasn't even 1%. I, I didn't have 1% of doubt. I, I thought it would certainly work. I, I didn't, because I, I saw the disparity in the marketplace. Um, it, it, it was it's pretty hard. It would be pretty hard to fail, I felt, anyway. Yeah. Perhaps overconfident but I did I, I did think of that I had a great team behind me um and, and there was definitely a need for it so yeah well it's funny because you know it's 15 years later and you're an overnight success right, right. so it, it's something that um you put a lot of work into and then eventually right. it's really popular and full disclosure I don't expect you to know this but my people who followed me on YouTube for a while know that I was very skeptical of CAC over the years because and and this is this is philosophical and, and maybe 
I like philosophical discussions, which is one of the reasons I like you because I've heard you talk before and, and you, you'll go there. But uh, as someone who likes coins and has been doing coins a while, I felt the same way about CAC that I felt about graded coins, which was, right. why do I need someone else to tell me? Sure. You know, there's actually that like angst as a dealer. I'm like, well, I don't need someone else to tell me, you know, and, right. you know, so you've, have you heard that one before? Oh, I've heard it many times. And as I explain to people, I don't believe I don't have, I've had these conversations with, with, with dealers that were you know, incredibly knowledgeable on how to grade. They didn't need me to tell them, but you know something sometimes, but there are many times where their customer needed to hear that, oh, this is a better coin. It really wasn't, this is really not for the people that, you know, the, the elite graders uh, uh, out there in the United States. This is really for the people who didn't know how to grade and, and to educate them and to put them in a level playing field. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and again, we're not, we're not performing miracles here. I mean, if, yeah. if, we, uh, if, if we place a sticker on a Barber half in Pro 67 and it brings $6,000 and, and the coins that, that fail the sticker, Many of them bring four thousand dollars. We're not, we're not doing anything. It's, it's, we're not doing anything incredible, or miraculous. Those coins would sell for more money anyway, amongst knowledgeable collectors and dealers. The, the, the better coins always sell for more. So we weren't creating value. We always, and you see our ads. Put a CAC sticker doesn't add value to the coin. The coin should already be better anyhow. We're just, we're just formalizing it, allowing those that don't have the time or expertise to grade to mm-hmm. to. A, I identify those coins. Do you think do you think you have an advantage as being a small place, um, kind of a niche within a niche? Because versus uh the other two big boys that you helped start, where you know, because it just seems to me like people don't understand who's grading the coins and who's looking at them. And yet over time you've established a certain level of trust and rapport with a certain area of the market. And I do you think that gives you some advantage to well, I don't think we've, a, I mean, as far as trust and uh, rapport, I, I believe there are a lot of people like yourself that were skeptical at first, and that was actually beneficial to CAC, believe it or not, because uh, I've said in other interviews, you know, there were times, the first five years of CAC, there were times where there would be like a, a large uh, auction at Stacks or at Heritage, and I would bid on X amount of CAC coins, I would buy half of them, two thirds of them. It was great having skepticism, right? And then, then C- CAC became more and more popular. And as it is today, I can't buy anything at an auction, right? So I can't buy my own products. It, it got too expensive for me. So in, in some in some respects, the success of CAC has hurt us. Um, and I, I actually forgot the question. So um, I'm, That's okay. I, think I, I, I forget the questions when I ask them. So oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. No yeah. worries. I just, you know, it's interesting to me that when you have a smaller market, a very, what okay. I'm getting at is the philosophy of, you know, you're talking about coins that would have sold for more anyway. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And right. one of the things that I appreciate the more that I kind of delve into the marketplace is understanding that, uh, that there's not the level of demand for certain things that sometimes we think there is. So the, so the big money coins get all the press, but it's a very, very small market, um, you know, portion of the market and i think that's a little bit about what i'm getting at with you know your company's success i think has a lot to do with the fact that you can play a little bit more into a niche market of correct you know collectors who are very serious one of the things that i really appreciate about appreciate about my youtube channel is the people who watch it whereas and no no offense to the guys that are stackers and coin roll hunters that's their thing they enjoy it but i feel like we have a lot of people who they are old school collectors they like classic coins they're not as usually as big into modern coins and i noticed that that really is something that cac also almost represents which is you know we're going for the classic collector we're not doing modern we're not you know we're not doing are you doing fancy labels i didn't even get to the big announcement are you doing any fancy labels on your new holders well fancy labels meaning um like i mean like a santa claus label i i guess Maybe we will. I haven't really given much thought to it. My so- I talked to my software team about it, and they were pulling their hair out about it. But um, one thing we are we are going to stress uh, on our website, and our dis- disclaimers and disclosures, is that um, you know a, a fancy label uh, doesn't doesn't result in a, a, a in a gain after market. In other words, 
Like, don't if, if you want a fans label, that's fine. You want an Easter Bunny label, that's fine. But but yeah. if you think you're going to get a premium for it when you want to sell it, you know that's to me that's misleading. So, you know the fact that you're creating value with a label to me that's something that we are certainly against. And whether we do labels or not, uh, if we do them, we're going to have disclaimers saying, "Don't expect this to add to the resale value of your coin." Yeah. Well, I guess I guess in this interview, I already I already hid the. Uh... It was that hit the lead. I buried the lead, which is, of course, so we're going from the green bean to actually poldering coins and grading coins, the whole thing that's going to stand up right against PCGS or NGC. And um, so as as you move that direction today, actually, as we're interviewing here, uh, you actually on your website put up the uh, just a, a computer generated mock up of the, the the holders and whatnot. And so one of the questions I had for you ahead of time, because you mentioned, Hey, you know, Ben, you have some YouTube followers that ask questions. The right. funny thing is you, you may feel like, uh, like you're launching the new iPhone or the new Nike, because I know that a lot of people are like, what's the holder going to look like. Right. And so, and, and I know that you're not, you don't care about that as much as other things, but truthfully, once again, the philosophy of, I don't want special holders or labels. I want people to collect the coin. Correct. Have a serious grade on it. We're not in the business. We're not in the business to just generate revenue. Correct. Which to me, I've been able to pick up just from listening to your interviews and seeing how you guys are doing. When you guys say no to certain things, to me, that's impressive because you're saying we're not here necessarily for the money. We're still here for the hobby. We'll make money, but that's, you know, we're right. doing a business. We're doing a service. That's a part of it. <laughs> so otherwise it doesn't work out. So no special labels. So we we've had people ask questions. I'll get to some of some viewers' okay, questions a little bit. Go ahead. This label concept is it's not a yes or no. We don't know if we're going to do it or not. But if yeah. we do, we're going to make sure that the buyer is not going in. I mean, I spoke to an eighty-seven-year-old buyer yesterday who spent three hundred eighty thousand dollars on special labels, and so that's to me, it's really not the label. It's not the modern coins. That's all harmless. But it's what some. It's the way some companies sell them. Yeah. As investments and to me we're 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 against that and no matter what we do um i don't think you know really even classic coins yeah could be represented as investments so it's it's we, we're here for the collector the investor that's a whole new thing and um uh, we I, I always tell collectors you know don't buy you know don't buy coins for investment and buy them for enjoyment they might be a good investment but that shouldn't be uh, the reason to buy coins yeah Yes, and I think we're kindred spirits on that. That's something I talk about a lot. And 100% on the labels, I understand that you may have certain labels for certain times or time periods, but you're, yes, and I understand what you're saying fully that you can't stop people from using your product right. in a way right. you don't approve of. I, right. I, I get that 100%. So um, some of the, a lot of the questions we had were about the grading going from the um, green bean with your ABC platform to now, okay, now, what's going to turn into a 64 versus 65 if you grade an A, B, and C? Is an A going to jump up a grade, and, or is a B, C going to drop a grade? How is that going to look philosophically? That's been really discussed on our website and our education forum. And, and, right, as we, and, and, and today, as we describe our grading, we don't, the C coin um, shouldn't end up in our holder. Of course, some do, and everyone has a different opinion of what a C coin is. But the way, the way I see it today, uh, it might be overly simplistic, but really the A coin or most A coins should get a plus. And the B coin, solid for the grade, will be, will have a straight grade. And what we call a C coin would be a coin might have slight problems, um, will end up either in a lower grade holder or in a detail. Right. So this gets me to, you know, some of the qualifications for a grade thing. So your C system has a lot more to do with coins that have something that is troubling to you as graders. Right. So you look at the coin, it's a certain type of a scratch that's too obvious or too long or too large. It's some area that has definitely had some cleaning to it, that type of thing. That was going to be one of my questions for you is, um, you know, will there be net grading? What people don't maybe know about net grading is I'll find coins that is a stunning coin. It looks like a 65 all day long and it'll be in a 62 holder. And immediately I know when I look at that coin, I'm going to find something somewhere that's a problem. And right. instead of the grading company saying, uh, you know, 
60, you know, unk details scratched, they'll just go ahead and give it that 62 grade. Is that is that kind of what we're talking about with neck rating? Yeah, I mean, I think neck rating is it's a slippery slope. So again, I I yeah. feel if, if there's a if it's an MS65 coin with a certain type of scratch and they grade it 62, I mean, if if the coin is worth 62 money, then there's really no harm, no foul. They're they're protecting the consumer. But if it's that kind of a scratch, you know, to me, the way I would see a coin like that, 65 coins were 62 money. I would prefer to call it. Um, MS60 details obverse scratch and just let the market decide and not put a grade on it. It's very difficult to see, is this scratch making it 65 or 64 or 63? And as you know, Ben, I mean, we had this, well, we had this the other day, an 1811 half came in, $1799 came in and, and they had scratches, but they were, you know, the $1799, you could tell this scratch happened in 1799 or shortly right. after. It was an old scratch. It wasn't that awful. We decided to sticker it. Um, you know, that was if that were a new scratch, someone took it out of a, out of a cellophane holder and put a staple scratch on it. If it were if it were half the size, and it were a shiny scratch, we would de- we wouldn't grade it, right? So, it's not just the scratch; it's it's the nature of the scratch. And did it happen in normal commerce? Did it happen purposely? Was someone trying to scratch something out of it, like corrosion or an initial? These are things that we're highly sensitive to. So it it's just not an easy yes or no question. But but yeah, yeah, certainly as, certainly and then. Right. Go ahead. But, but as far as the the net grade, and we just prefer, and again, it happens every week usually. A ninety three S dollar comes in, or a ninety five O dollar comes in. It's a super slider AU fifty eight plus, but it's been cleaned. They knock it down to a fifty. It's worth fifty money, but we find it a little bit offensive. We prefer to call it AU fifty details cleaned. So we, uh, you can see a lot more coins in our deep. You can see a lot of coins details that you normally wouldn't see in the marketplace. Yeah. So, you know, Annex, Annex has done that historically, which I find interesting, which is uh, instead of just saying a grade range in details, they would actually put a grade or put a net grade. Historically, I don't know if they're doing it still, but you'd actually see something where it'll say they'll put a numeric net grade or they'll tell you what their grade was before and then the problem is on it. Yeah. I find this to be an interesting philosophy because I, you know, that's very different than just saying something very generic. Right. So I always feel like the more that the grading company can tell the consumer, the right. better. Well, that's true. But I, I would I would tell you that you know, in our business, um, you know, you have an MS sixty five ninety five oh dollar, which could be two hundred thousand dollars, and and you mentioned net, you put MS sixty five net grade sixty two because of scratches. I mean, you really don't know how the coins can be sold. I think it, it, it's 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 you know, it's subject to being misrepresented. So I would prefer to just call it MS60 details because uh, the higher grade, you know, some marketers will just shoot for that. I mean, I've seen e-listings with all sorts of misinformation. Um, So I think it would be confusing to do it that way. Yeah. Well, are you, are you, are you excited to grade rock coins again? Well, I I don't know about excited. I mean, like I think you know, people are. I, I hear many from many that oh, it's so much easier to grade a coin than a holder. Well, it actually isn't. It's easier for a grader to pick up a coin. Usually, the grade comes to them immediately, as opposed to being in a holder. You see a grade, so you're a little bit biased. You don't agree with it. You're trying to figure it out. Plus, you have the glare. You can't really see the coin that well. It's much difficult. It's it's really tricky. It's hard. I mean, I it, I do about 500 coins a day, and and it's pretty tough. And I could do a thousand coins, raw coins a day, you know, with ease. So, um, I think it'd be a lot easier to grade raw coins personally. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, 100 percent agree with that. I mean, I can pick up old raw coins and check them out very easily compared right. to right slabs. It's tricky, and some of the slabs, even in a new holder, are hard to see through. And then you get something that's been on the bourse a thousand times. Yeah. You can't even you can't even see well, through yeah, it. Well, the holder gets yeah it's tattered a little bit. Sure. Yeah, th- that creates a lot of questions yeah. and difficulty. So, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's uh, interesting to note here that another difference between you and the other grading companies, of course, you're still in business, right? You you're buying and selling coins. Yes. Well, they, that's about yeah. That's uh, we're gonna we're gonna wind down the old CAC though for the new CAC. Yeah, but I mean, you're still gonna be doing your your coin business, correct? Like well, yeah, but, but I'm not going to have much time for it. I mean, I'll make markets yeah. on 
certain widely traded areas, but you know, making markets these days, I mentioned that to John Feig about the interview, it's really overrated. I have a lot of bids, but I don't buy anything. I mean, the market is so strong that really I find myself buying coins when I'm making markets, when the market's faltering or the market's weak, then they come to me for liquidity. But in this type of market, I can't remember the last time someone hit my bid on on, on the screen, right? So I'm not gonna, have, I'll have very little time for that. I think I'll be busy with, with CAC. Well, yeah, I'd imagine you'll be busy. I, I, yeah. I'd imagine you'll be plenty busy. Sure. I don't know how you have, how you have time for half the stuff you do. Maybe yeah. you don't know either. Especially yeah. now you're gonna be in two locations, right? At least for a while. Right. Yes, we'll be here in uh, New Jersey, and but the main plant will be in Virginia Beach. Yeah, well, you know, I I kind of made made a joke the other day that you know you should move to Tucson and find yeah. out. You know, I mean, yeah, the summers are hot. I get it, but yeah, yeah. but the winters are really nice. You know, and yeah. the real estate might be cheaper than that is back east, but yeah, you know, yeah. but but all of your story goes back to New Jersey anyway. So I'd imagine it's hard to uproot from sure from the East Coast. Yeah. So. It could happen. I mean, my my wife and I both love the beach. So Virginia Beach was a, a certainly a draw. You know, it's a much easier place to attract talent. Um, yeah. And again, housing there seems to be about forty percent less than New Jersey, and it's it's definitely much more afford, affordable. Virginia Beach. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that that uh, attracting talent thing because you know I'm I'm curious. You know, this has to do probably a lot with how before I get to the talent, how do you gauge how busy you're going to be when you finally do your soft launch? Or are you just going to? Well, paint yeah. Yourself? Well, again, I mean, the, the soft launch is going to be really just the the original partners, which will be a little over, a few over a hundred, and they'll they'll we'll, we'll have enough coins in the pipeline to train our staff. Once we're fully trained, we're then going to um, open up for phase two, which will be current CAC members will be able to submit, and that's about three thousand members. And then once we We'll have to figure out our, our, our capacity with our current grading team, where we're comfortable. And, and um, you know, that might be month three or month four. And then we will allow, you know, we have a waiting list currently for members. We'll start letting maybe 10 or 20 uh, members uh, a week come in from the waiting list. You know, it's quite a bit of, um, it's actually, you know, like to have to have like 300 members, you know, join in one day. It's actually, it might sound like it's a boon for business, but it takes it takes quite a bit of time for customer service to acclimate someone to educate them on how to submit coins. So it's a, it's a handholding process. It could take an hour or two, you know, for, for many, for many submitters for their first time. So yeah. you, I mean, have 300 people in one day, how could you possibly service them? Right. Yeah, correct. Correct. And that, that's a part of the thing Well, I, I really thought you guys would have so much demand. You wouldn't, you'd have to hire all kinds of different graders and whatnot, but but of course, you can you help pace your demand, which is which sure. is a smart way to do it. So, but but how many? Uh, I mean, how many graders are you starting off with as you open up here and with the with the? Well, we have our top three. We have our top three, as you, you mentioned, was John Butler, Bill Shamhart, and Ron Javuski. And then from there, we have we have three or four others um, that we're about to hire and plenty of resumes actually. Uh, but like I said, we're not. You know, it, we're going to integrate them slowly. It's not going to be, uh, we're just not going to hire graders, right? It's um, we're going to have master grading sets, and that'll be our, that'll sort of be the benchmark of where our standards will be, and um, yeah. we'll have guest graders coming as, as well. So. Yeah, well, I think that uh, you know having having the grading sets, I think, is brilliant. I, you know, I encourage people to do that when. Um, uh, you know, and that's something that Bill Fivai told me about. Also, he had sent me some grading sets and stuff, and it's really sure. cool because, you know, it, it uh, people have I think a lot of wrong impressions about what it's like. People think it'd be cool to be a grader until you've got to look at five hundred to a thousand coins a day. Right. You know, it's like the people say it's great to travel for business. It's great to travel right. for, and, until you have to travel all the time, and then you're like, yeah, okay. right. it, it can get kind when of. I was, when I was in my twenties. It was sort of glamorous. I was from a farm town. I was traveling. Wow, that's a big deal. But you do get tired. And again, grading sets, as you know, it's it's part of staying sharp and part of calibration. And that's one thing I regret at CAC here. We don't have a grading set. So sometimes I, as I mentioned in other interviews, after a vacation or after a weekend, Monday morning, you're a little bit of a fog. It'd be nice to have a grading set to refer to just to get just to get calibrated. And um I mean, you know, you're from, well, you're from Arizona, or you're from Arizona? Yep, yep. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I mean, 
if you're a baseball fan, I'm sure you, I always use baseball analogies. I've used Albert Pujols, but I'm sure Paul Goldschmidt took batting practice every day, right? And he's one of the best hitters ever, right? And but he still needed to practice, right? So, and he has a hitting coach and everything else. So that's, um, it's, it's really, it, it is sort of like riding a bicycle, but, in, but you still have to stay sharp. And I think the grading sets, I think, are, are, are a, will be a, 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 a needed tool for that. Yeah. Have you, I mean, the technology stuff's coming along so far, and I know a lot of people are, are interested in changing the world really quickly overnight. And um, I, I have a strange question. You can, you can claim this for yourself. Have, do you think there'll be a day when there's decentralized grading? And what I mean by that is um, you actually literally have people in different states that are, you know, people can submit to but they don't have to come to you. So you don't have to relocate to Virginia Beach right. uh, or wherever else, you know, you know, someone is. You actually can just find a way to go ahead and I, you know, using sports makes me think of this, but you can right. actually somehow because you know, I thought it was interesting that you become a PCGS or NGC authorized dealer, and all that meant was that people could bring you their coins and you send it to somebody else. And right. I always thought it would be really cool to have locations where you can really drop stuff off, have it looked at have it graded, you know, maybe the finalization step is somewhere else. But to me, I think that this is something that's, it's just a concept in my yeah. brain. It's not impo- I mean, listen, first of all, there are specialists out there. You have a guy like John Ager, you know, and, and um, I think he's in Massachusetts. He specializes in colonials. And, um, you know, it would be pretty neat if people could just send the colonials to John Ager, right? So I, I, I understand what you mean. It would, it, would, it would make sense, especially in esoteric, uh, fields where there's not a lot of uh, widespread knowledge, colonials being one of them, you know, perhaps Pioneer, another one. I mean, Rick Snow with, with Indian head sense, right? So I understand that's something, it's not impossible. Um, it does cost a fortune, though, I think, the ship thing. I, knows, I, I can't believe I see some of the packages and what people pay for postage. It's awful. It, it, by the way, this, this gets to the same, you know, the cost involved gets me to back to that idea of, you know, if you're able to do grading and slabbing in multiple locations across the country where people can come in and, and do stuff, you know, there's just cost involved with so much of this stuff. But I think that there's other areas where you can maybe, I don't know, circumvent some of that, I think, is maybe right. what I'm it's at. It's also, and as you know, it's impossible to grade through photographs. So you can send photos to your experts, but you got to sort of get an idea. But yeah. I've always been possible to grade from the photo. And, yeah, no, I, I agree. You can't grade necessarily yeah. from that. And I, what speaking of photos, you guys, you got to have this is the thing. Everyone's worried about the graders, but now you, of course, have to have someone who's set up to take photos. Yeah. All the computer stuff, but I already know you've got that stuff tackled because you have someone else doing it for you, which is the smartest way to run anything. <laughs> is to have someone who knows what they're doing take care of it sure. for you. So is there anything new in front of the technology world though that you guys get to apply maybe that's different than what the other companies are using so far? I, I don't think so. I, I don't look at the coin business as a technology business. I could be wrong. To me, it's, I mean, I guess there there's all sorts of bells and whistles, but to me, it's, I, I believe that uh, the competition, you know, and the, the grading wars, so to speak, will be won or lost in the grading room. Period, and you could have the best technology in the world, and the best registry sets, and the best everything. And uh, but without the grading, without a, a strong fundamental product, um, you know, I, I think it'd be short lived. Yeah, I'm laughing because I'm thinking, you know, I, I use sports analogies a lot too. And what you said right now is just like, okay, for anyone who watches football, it's won and lost at the line all the right. time. That, right. I mean, that's really where it counts. Everyone wants to talk about the the, the high paid guys on the end, but those linemen really win and lose games yeah, all day long. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and it's yeah. true. And so it'll be interesting yeah. to see. How Tom Brady has played when he gets sacked six times a game. He doesn't look so great, does he? But when he's protected, he's great. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, I, uh, I think, I think I got to ask one more question here real quick and then get going, get you back on your, your, to your day. Um, how much, how much do you think registry sets fuel the hobby? 
Well, I think they do. I think they do for a small amount. And again, you're you're in a coin store, so you so you know that. I believe I believe um, the registry sets. I think it might be the upper end of the market, the most glamorous part of the market. But I do think the nuts and bolts of the coin business are the guy coming in, spending 120 bucks a week, buying silver bars, completing a set. It's really uh, very much of a. Uh, I mean, it's a great hobby and. And the registry sets might be fine for the top one, two percent of the collectors, but it's such a small part of it. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's a people like to highlight it because it, it's glamorous, but but you know it's 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 really the guy coming in. You know, I I I went to my old coin store about five years ago in, in Flemington, New Jersey, and I sat there for two hours and just watching people coming in and you know, buying their silver, their silver bars, filling in their sets. It was just. You know these people. They, these guys aren't watching your video, or are not on our website, and they're not in registries. They're just regular guys, and and they're and they're buying coins by several hundred people in a small town buy coins every month. So um, there's a lot more to the hobby than what we than what we see um, at some of these high profile events. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I we we preach hobby here. You know, uh, we try to have content for people who are beginners to advanced collectors. So we try to cover all of our bases and it's a pretty broad spectrum. Right. Yeah. So, all right. So, so anything that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? Well, yeah. So I, I did see one of your videos uh, a few videos ago and which I was interested in because you mentioned, you mentioned about like the 500 coins a day and how could they have a disagreement only seven or eight coins. And, and, and I just, to yes. check. So, and I remember, and you mentioned to me, one of your mentors, which was a great mentor, Alan Rowe, and you brought him a silver commend and you said, you know, this could be a 66. And he said, yeah, but you have to buy it as a 65. You might get a 66, but you can't pay that kind of money for it. That's how I like to look at CAC. Whereas like, if you see a, if you see a really nice York commend and you think it could 66, well, that's why you have 65 plus, right? And we want to give the benefit of the doubt to our, to our members and our consumers that, you know, like here's a nice MS65 or a five plus, and it could be a six, I guess, right? But when it comes time to actually sell the coin and, and someone brings it into a coin store and wants to get paid for it, they they always tend to be more conservative and knock it down a little bit. And you know, we, we like to think of our coins, most of our coins would hold up in, in value if they were taken out of the holder. So and I always felt that, you know, one day full circle. It could come back to full circle one day where coins are only worth what they're worth as a holder. And to me, that's how, you know, being a coin dealer, that's how I like to look at them. And when push comes up, if I'm looking at a coin and I'm thinking, gee, is this saying an MS65 or a, or a 64? When push comes to shove, I think, well, you know, I wouldn't pay 65 money for it. So therefore, it's not a 65. Maybe that's the wrong way to grade. But on borderline coins, you have to look at it that way for the consumer. Yeah, one of one of my favorite concepts is that that grades don't matter, price does. Right. And, you know, it's that's exactly what you're getting at there. Some people don't understand the statement, but it really it really is what what matters is what are two guys willing to negotiate negotiate a price on something. So, well, I know you've got lots to do. Thanks so much for your time. How can people find you if you got any updates or where should they go if you got anything to website to tank, send them to? Yeah. Well, we have an edu- We have a, a, our website, cacoin.com, uh, we, and we do have an educational forum. Lots of uh, lots of members asking questions. I think we have about seventeen or eighteen questions that are now been answered up there. So there's some there are some obvious questions and some esoteric questions, and we're going to build on the FAQs. So um, yeah. you're welcome okay. to join. We'll have we'll have that link in our in our show notes here. So, John, thanks so much for your time, and good luck with the new venture. All right, Ben. Thank you. Appreciate it.